So there's a guy whose uh, artistic uh, capabilities is limited to stick figures and Instagram filters. Seth Familian here is a guy you kind of make you wish you could be. Uh, Seth is the founder of Maptivate, a community visualization and engagement platform. He's the founder and principal of Familian and One, the interface and insights design consultancy, and he's also a graduate of Harvard and Berkeley. So please join me in welcoming him here. Thank you for such a sweet introduction. I would aspire to be like me too sometimes as well. It gets a little weird. Um, come on in if you're if you're just joining us. And is everyone sufficiently caffeinated? I know there's that post-lunch sort of lull, so I'm going to try and energize you back up as much as possible. Um, and I'm here today to talk about something called persuasive visualization, which is how you use the visualization of data to affect actions amongst stakeholders, amongst board members, amongst others that you're exposing that data to. And as I have this conversation with you, I want it to be a conversation. So if you get confused about something, or if I'm going too fast, or something doesn't make sense, stop me, shout, ask me a question. I promise to repeat it for the camera. But um, it's important that we engage in a dialogue about this, because that's how I think all of us can learn the most. Before we dive into three key tenets of persuasive visualization. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit more detail so you understand sort of where I'm coming from in my context. So I have a background in corporate strategy for Apple and for Bertelsmann. I've made really big, burly models that have way too many reference and lots of complexity and crazy growth curves. I've done the same for smaller companies like Get Satisfaction, which is a crowdsourced customer service platform based in San Francisco, and Adorama, which is a camera retailer out of New York. We're actually getting to look at some work I did for Adorama as part of this. And finally, uh, I've also done corporate strategy for nonprofits. I've been on the board of an organization called Root Division, which is an arts education nonprofit in San Francisco. Uh, for about four years, I was the treasurer, and I applied a couple of database techniques as well, uh, which we'll explore in depth. I'm also a product and an engineering manager. So I understand how to prioritize product flows, how to talk to engineers, how to engage that scrum process, how to write specs, how to design wireframes and mockups. Uh, I did this first for JPEG and Everywhere, which were two crowdsourced um, magazine publishing platforms that aren't really as robust as they were back in 2008, 2007 when I was working on them. But nonetheless, they're great examples of how you can creatively uh, generate print content by leveraging the internet. And that's where I really cut my teeth on product management. And most recently, for the last two and a half years, as I've been doing my consulting work, I've also been product managing and overseeing the product strategy for GradMap, which a lot of you, I think, got exposed to uh, as part of this conference. Do you need to raise your hand if you signed into the map that was associated with this conference? Yes! Hopefully, all of you will sign in by the end of this conference, and you'll be able to leverage the map uh, in order to connect with one another, both here and afterwards as well. Finally, I'm an experienced designer, so I have a pretty strong design passion and background. Um, I've done website design for artists and art galleries like Bergamot Station and Shoshana Wayne Gallery in Los Angeles, for individual artists like Alexi Laurent, and I also make my own art. Uh, I've published photo books, I've hacked Ikea furniture, I build coffee tables, I, I like making things. And that's one of the reasons I moved from here into here because I was sort of done just writing slide decks. It wasn't enough for me. I had to build things, and ideally things that could scale. So that's why I'm sitting in front of you today. But enough about me. Let's talk about persuasive visualization, and specifically three, a conceptual framework to understand what do I mean by persuasive visualization? What do I mean data plus design equals engagement? Well, we're at a data conference, so let's start with data, because that's going to underlie anything we work with. And data to me is stats and metrics. And when you combine data with two different types of design, you end up with persuasive visualization. The first type is called aesthetics. It's visual design, right? So that's making things look pretty. And at the intersection of those two things is what I call visual metrics. Things become highly intuitive when they look really beautiful and simple on a page. There's less argument about what is going on and more discussion about how to solve the problem. The second intersection is a different type of design called game design. It's not aesthetic design. It's motivation oriented. And how many of you are familiar with game theory or game design? Gamification, as it's been called. So that's really what this is all about. And it's about leveraging through something called game mechanics, 
this, ability, this human psyche interaction. So you're creating experiences that are highly relevant, and especially when you're using data in combination with, game, with motivation game design. And finally, when you combine aesthetics and motivation, you get an immersive experience, right? So it's really pretty, and it's really relevant, so wow, it's super immersive. You bring all those together, and you've got true engagement. So what we're gonna talk about in the next 40 or so minutes, and then I'll open it up to questions, is what's a couple examples of visual metrics, what are a couple examples of game mechanics, and then how does that lead into some pretty powerful examples of engagement? So there are three types of things. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. The first thing we'll cover is visual metrics, and that's the idea of eliminating these walls of text for better design. So how many of you looked at the spreadsheet and you go, oh, okay, I just don't know. Anyone? You look at a wall of text and you don't know what it means? Yes, okay, that is pretty much anyone in a strategic role faces this problem, and we are pretty visual beings by instinct, and so it takes a lot of training to read a row and, re and need some insight out of it. So that's what visual metrics solves, that wall of text. Game mechanics, we're gonna talk about leveraging ego and competition alongside data visualization. And finally, we're gonna talk about the concept of pre-connection, which is engaging with individuals around curiosity, anticipation, and utility, which for any of you who signed into the Drive 2014 map, experienced before coming into this room. So let's start with visual metrics and eliminating those walls of text. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples from my own work. The first is a self-storage company that's based in Sun Valley, Idaho, called Valley Self Store, and a sister facility called South Valley Storage. I'm on the board along with my mom, she's one of four partners, and about 10 years ago I was asked to start conducting all of the financial analysis for Valley Self Store. Just to help the four partners understand what's going on with the business. It took me a while to figure out how to really create the right reporting structure. So the board meeting wasn't really spent figuring out what was going on, but instead focusing on strategy and discussing how to change things for the better. I would get these reports every month. I have 95 of them. These reports list all of the occupancies, the unit per square foot, the revenues, etc., for all these different unit types at Valley Self Store and at South Valley. And I thought, this is not helpful. Like, this is great. This is a good, raw data source but let's make it look a little bit better. So I just put it in Google Docs, it was pretty simple, and I made this. And these are just aggregates, right? So this is overall occupancies, this is occupancy rate, uh, and then these are occupancies by unit type. So I clustered, I basically took uh, this long row of individual unit sizes and segmented them, basically. And it wasn't simply just to have a Google Docs visualization. Uh, why I made this thing. It was so I could take screenshots and I could put them into emails and I could explain to the partners what was going on on a monthly or quarterly basis. So one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we're talking about visualization and data is a picture's not enough. It's also about the narrative that you create. And in this case, it's a simple narrative. It's saying overall occupancies have been rebounding and um, you know, basically the two occupancy rates are at parity now. So it's hand-holding people through reading that graph. A picture is a thousand words, but a couple of words of context also really helps. So, Valley Self Store is an example of a small set of data. This is an example of an enormous set of data. Adorama is one of my uh, consulting clients. They have 8.4 million transactions in their database across five years. They have 250,000 affiliate IDs, which we had to cross-tabulate against those transactions to try and determine trends in 28 subchannels. Are you exhausted yet? <laughs> Kind of a lot. And I spent the first, I'd say, year to 18 months working with this data, doing it sort of by hand. Mm -hmm. So I created a methodology in a program called Stata to churn through the data every four months and then spit out these reports that I've taken to Excel and roll up data even more and then take them into Keynote and make really pretty charts. But that work would take about 30, 40 hours every time I would do it, and it just felt like sort of code monkey work. It didn't feel like actual analysis. It was just doing all this effort to create the basis of delivering insights. So I decided to use a platform called Splunk. Is anyone familiar with Splunk? Okay, keep your hand up if you love Splunk. Yeah, all the same hands are up because Splunk is an incredible, incredible tool for big data analysis, especially for scrubbing, translation, deduplication. I don't work for Splunk. I don't have a partnership agreement with them. But I will tell you that even in their free version, it's really powerful as a way of sucking in huge data sets, creating a relational database on the fly, and ultimately producing charts like this, which is what I now do. 
So I've, I've had to sort of block some of the actual numbers because they need to be sensitive to the client information. But then nonetheless, you can see that all these charts are, are generated on the fly. All the deltas, all the KPIs are generated on the fly, as are all the calculations and the data tables at the bottom. So I just take screenshots, just like I did for Valley Self Store. And I can do it for not just overall trends, but we're gonna dive into Adorama.com and look at trends within the website channel. And these are all their major channels. And before I tell you about how I make the presentation, there's another technique that I'm using here that's really powerful. It's called the technique of small multiples. And Edward Tufte talks about small multiples. The idea is, rather than creating a stacked bar chart of tons of stuff going on and trying to literally read between the lines, break it out and create a ton of little charts. Because your eye and your brain is actually designed to see the subtle differences between these charts quite quickly. It's way more accessible than a stacked bar that you're trying to unpack in your mind. Stacked bars are still useful, they're useful for aggregates, but it's really important to think about if you have large sets of data and you want to see little tiny trends across all the different subsets of that data, small multiples, incredible. I take this dashboard that gets auto-generated by Splunk, with updating a couple variables and adding a new data file, and I'm able to produce this, which is a little small, I'm sorry for that, but that's a slide. This slide took about two minutes to build. It used to take two hours or three hours because I would update all the charts by hand. Now, everything's set up for screenshots, drop it in, and what do I focus on? I focus on this text over here. I focus on the bullet points. I focus on the insights. I focus on what are we saying about these trends? What are the business implications? Because that's what really matters. So now, Adoram's management is completely used to this format. And every four months I deliver a new report and they don't waste time arguing about what's going on they spend time discussing what needs to be done, how to adjust strategy. Kind of sound like a broken record on this, but it's something I keep seeing in a lot of my work, so I just want to drive it home. Another example is Root Division. So Root Division is a nonprofit arts organization in San Francisco. I've been on the board for a number of years, actually just stepped off the board in January. Root Division has eight board members, and it grew to 10, then it grew to 12, and I would go to the board retreats every year. I quickly became the treasurer because, you know, the History and literature guy I totally became the treasurer. I went to business school, I don't know, maybe. So this is what would usually be presented to the board. Wall of text. And again, it's really hard to read the trends. So what would happen in the board meetings is no one would really pay attention to the numbers. It was like the dreaded numbers section of the meeting where everyone would be like, oh, we, fine, we trust the treasurer, I'm sure it's good. And you could basically get any fiscal policy moved through the organization because no one knew what was going on. That was not a really good long-term strategy for success. So I decided, let's use Google Docs again. Simple, right, simple tool. Let's visualize, let's roll it up and visualize revenues across four different sources, expenses across four different sources, and net profit. Whoa, that's a lot easier to read and it's a lot easier to see. And you'll notice that I'm using headlines to create that narrative as well. Because again, it's about hand-holding. It's about if I'm not in the room, and someone sees the printout of that page, and by the way, this deliberately fits on one page, and that's it, then they can actually see what's the financial status of our organization, what are the big strategic conversations we need to have. Here's an interesting story about this data. We started graphing it to the left of the red line, of the orange lines. And look at what happened to revenues, I mean expenses, rent, revenues, but look at what happened to revenues to the right of the orange line. I'm not fully attributing this to data visualization, but <laughs> left of the orange line, this was, so that there was, this is totally because of database, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to point out in meetings this slow decline of revenues, and this sort of flat line creeping up growth in profits, and then boom, look at this $18,000 drop in net. So this was, it was kind of hard to see, unless you really rolled up the numbers big, and people weren't really doing that in their financial analyses, they were getting into the nitty gritty. We rolled it up and we saw, oh, okay, where are we losing? And what's going on? And then at this point, instead of it being super crisis moment, we kind of knew we were there. And so then all of a sudden, every year, we would really push forward on a revenue generation strategy and these charts would reinforce psychologically the board's sense of accomplishment, the executive director's sense of accomplishment. So these became both an awareness mechanism, but also a cheering section, a reinforcement mechanism which is really important. Because people like to see something on the paper and go, wow, yeah, I helped do that. That's great. So this is just making pictures pretty, right? Making data pretty. What about getting some game mechanics involved? 
uh, using a little more sort of deep-seated psychology. Well, when I was on the board of Root Division, one of the big financial issues that we had was something called GiveGet. Do you guys know what GiveGet is? Raise your hand if you know what GiveGet is. Good, I'll explain it really quickly. GiveGet is a commitment that you make as a board member to give a certain amount of money each fiscal year or to get that same amount of money from donations or in-kind gifts, etc. So, and this is really this uh, transition over into game mechanics. So with GiveGet, what we decided to do so there's all this argument over the $1,800 give-get requirement we had across these three categories of direct, which means I give it, indirect, which means I get someone else to give it, and in-kind means I generate the revenue for the organization. So I teach a class, and the class generates revenue through seat sales, and then all of a sudden I get credited for that amount. People are spending a lot of time in board meetings arguing over these amounts, 600, 600, 600, because they felt like it was really unfair. And people felt like, ah, oh, it's low, I don't know, it feels arbitrary, so I'm like, we need to chart this out. So I charted it and I would put, I put this spreadsheet up on the projector in the board meeting every time we met as a board. And it was a leaderboard. And it showed how everyone was doing against all their commitments. And guess what happened? We met our goal as a result. And not only that, the next year, we didn't just generate $10,000, we generated $15,000. And the next year, we generated, well, let me go back, actually. So then what happened after we generated $15,000 is we thought, huh, this is kind of working. We got a, like a 30% lift in give-get commitments with, not, with even a smaller number of board members, right? All people gray at the bottom dropped off the board. So we saw some board churn. We still generated more money. So the executive director and I decided, you know what? Let's hide these columns of raw numbers and let's have a meeting, just the executive director and the board member, every single year to set personal goals for each of these categories that must start at $600, but they can go anywhere north. And we're just gonna show percentages. And that's what we did the next year, and look what happened. $15,000 to $25,000. Everyone set their own goals. No one knew the actual dollars except for the executive director and the root of it and, um, and me. And yet, just being accountable to your other board members meant you had to make this commitment work. You couldn't not. That's gamification. There's this underlying subtle psychological dynamic going on, not necessarily negative, it's just accountability in this case. And then it grew again, and by the fourth year, we were up to $30,000 in, uh, in direct and in-kind giving across basically the same roster as we started with in terms of count. 10 to 30 grand, all because of gamification. So I'm really fascinated with gamification and not just how it applies to board member performance, but how it applies to fundraising in general. And I first got to experiment with it at the Haas School of Business in 2007 when I was a second year MBA student. And I was asked to run something called the Lifelong Connections Campaign and conduct the marketing efforts for that campaign. And the goal of the campaign was to optimize participation. It's just a, it's a, a, a pledge campaign. It wasn't a gift, so you weren't writing a check. You were just saying, yes, I will give and I could use whatever marketing tactics I wanted to. And I thought, God, that old campaign thermometer is so boring. It's just, it's a bar chart, it's incremental, it's filled with mercury, that's really dangerous. <laughs> like, why don't can we just use something else that's more personal and meaningful and maybe cultivates a little bit of competition as well? Well, my class of 2007, 240 students, those students on the first day of the first year were divided into four 60-person groups known as cohorts and each cohort took classes with the rest of their cohort the whole first year. Drank beer together, played the cohort Olympics together. There was a lot of tight connection between those cohorts. By the way, people who are standing in, there's, there are a couple seats uh, that are still available off to the side if you'd like to come in. Yay, more people. Visualization, go. <laughs> so, I'm slightly enthusiastic about this. So, we had these four cohorts of 60 people each, and I decided let's make a thermometer that's based on these cohorts. So we visualized it using something called a force-directed layout, where we had all 60 nodes pointing to a center node using the first, one of the first iterations of a visualization toolkit known as Prefuse. And now it's D3, sort of the latter day incarnation of Prefuse. But then it got interesting, because we put this image on a poster that's four feet wide by three feet tall, that sat in the courtyard next to the table where we were soliciting for commitments to the campaign, and we print out photo labels of every student in the class. And every time someone said they would give, we put their photo on their cohort, and we updated the participation rate inside the cohort and for the overall class. 
What do you think happened? <laughs> laughter happened? Yeah, laughter happened. Ego got involved pretty intensely. People walked by this poster and said, what? I I'm in blue, why is my photo not on there? So well, you need to give to the campaign. Oh, okay, fine. So we had a lot more participation as a result. Then, at this point, when there was a critical mass of participants in each of the four cohorts, the cohorts themselves got competitive because they are such predictable business school students. And so, <laughs> Gold, which was in first place, is bragging publicly, we're in first, we're the best, Axe, which is my cohort actually was in last place, we're emailing ourselves internally, beating each other up, being like, come on, we can do better than this, guys. This was the end result. 99.6% participation over five weeks, one holdout who ethically disagreed with the idea of committing to giving to the school before he had graduated, I wonder why there weren't more. <laughs> it's a pretty arm bendy kind of <laughs> set of tactics at the end there. But it taught me a really interesting lesson. First of all, it blew me away, it blew Haas away. They gave me a fundraising award in 2007. And then it got me thinking, can I make this digital? Because I don't want to be in a business making posters and stickers and going around to schools. That doesn't feel like a very tech savvy entrepreneurial play. But there might be a there there. Like what? There, there seems to be something here. This seems like a pretty solid paper sticker prototype. So it got me thinking about this platform called Bradmap. I had to let a couple of years go by. I had to learn how to be a product manager. I had to learn how to integrate APIs. I had to wait for Facebook's API and for LinkedIn's API to be accessible and for social science to be the norm. And I had to wait for D3 to come around because before then, the visualization toolkits were too processor intensive and they would basically crash anyone's computer. So this is what ultimately resulted. And this was the first iteration. It's called GrabMap, and the core concept behind it is this notion of self-segmentation. Because where were all, where, where were the cohort affinities going to come from? They were gonna come from the school, but where were other affinities going to come from? Like where people are living, and what industry they're in, and things like that. Because we couldn't just visualize cohorts, we wanted to visualize useful, other useful variables as well. The school didn't have any of that information. So the core concept of GrabMap was School provides data, simple CSV file, four columns, external ID, first name, last name, email address, actually five columns, whether or not they donated this fiscal year and how much, so we can flag it over a threshold to give them a badge for being in this certain society. And this is what results. Just a blank map, no one in there. And if you click on someone's profile, like I'm in this map, so you click my profile, it's really boring. My profile is just terribly boring. There's a generic icon, there's my name, there's the fact that I'm an ax, there's the fact that I'm a campaign participant, that's really it. So the magic of the grad map premise is to combine school data with social data. And the way we do it is by sending out an email invitation to everyone in the classes. Oh, it looks like the email invitation you guys received for the drive map, huh? And what they do is they click on this little link right here. And this link is a very special link. It's an authentication link that's appended with a passcode that is unique to each user within the database and it can only be used once and expires after a certain amount of time. So we can use that link to establish the connection between the sparse data that we have in the database and the click action of the person in the email. And when they click back, I'm the person who clicks back and welcomes me and says, hey Seth, he knows it's Seth, he knows it's me. Let's just set up your profile before proceeding. The first thing you're gonna do is confirm your first name, last name, and email address. Boom, this is your first opportunity for user-provided accuracy. What if their email address is no longer the most usable one. What if they provide, what if I want to give a Gmail address instead? Great, I can do that. What if my last name has changed? What if I you know, got married and we combined, we compounded our names? I can put that in here too. Then I have an option to sign in, either with LinkedIn or with Facebook. Or not feeling the social sign-in vibe, which about 35 to 40% of our users are not comfortable with social sign-ins, just to be clear. Then they will just enter a password and hit go. So we designed for that case, because that case is pretty prevalent. And in doing so, the last step of the sign-in process is that I confirm my information. So if I've signed in with LinkedIn, it sort of automatically pulls my photo and my title and um, my industry and sub-industry. I enter my city, I confirm that I'm an ax, it pulls in my summary, and boom, my profile's complete. And I can associate other social profiles with my profile as well. So you can access me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. And then my face appears on the map. So my face appears, and then more people sign in, and more faces appear, and then more people sign in, and more faces appear. And the idea, ultimately, around the gamification giving piece of Grad Map was, 
We're only going to show the faces of people who have given to the campaign. Everyone else will remain an anonymous gray dot. And here's an example of that. Oh, sorry. And so as as people, more people sign in, then these these submaps of cities and industries they start taking shape, right? So I didn't know any of this information before those signings, and now all of a sudden I know the people who are in San Francisco and all the other cities that are represented within this cluster of people. So in this first iteration of Grab Map, we really used it around fundraising, and this is kind of what it looked like. So you would click and sign, you know, you basically see you not yet participating. I can basically click around on these different affinity groups and say, oh, who's an ax? And then it'll show me everyone in ax who's given but no one else. It rank orders all the different cohorts against one another to drive gamification. It shows the rank of those cohorts in a more sort of zoomed out view as well. But it's balancing that sense of competition with cohesion, with bringing everyone together in this view called an everyone view. And because I haven't yet given <coughs> the campaign, it basically says, you not yet participating, there's a prompt at the top saying, hey, give, hey, nudge, give. I wanted to call this platform a long nudge for a while. <laughs> and so when I click the give button, it's integrated into Berkeley's existing giving flow, so I'm not processing transactions, though we have the ability to do so through Stripe. It passes in their external ID via get variable. They then fill out their giving information. We ping the back end, and we're looking at a feed of all of the recent digital gifts. And as soon as we find a match between the ID that we provided and the ID that's listed in the feed, and boom. Their credit is a participant in their map, they're visible. They also receive an email saying that they are now visible in the map. And then they have different things they can do. They can see their impact, they can write a note on their profile about why they gave, why they chose to support the institution, and most importantly, they can encourage others, because this was built as a viral giving platform. So to do that, you basically go, click on encourage others, and then Facebook sells, select all the people who have registered but haven't yet given, and you say, hey, let's write you an email. So you write an email, it customizes to each of those individuals, and now you've empowered the donor as an encourager within this system. Who thinks it worked? Who thinks it kind of worked? Who thinks it didn't work at all? Aw, oh, you can tell me if it didn't work at all. It's cool. But okay. It kind of worked. It didn't totally work. Here's what happened. So in the first reunion, in the fifth reunion that we ran in a first pilot test in 2012, we saw 31 to 55% lift in participation rates compared to 20 year averages. That's admittedly a pretty long average. But nonetheless, we saw a lift in participation rates. We didn't see a lift, a significant lift in dollars raised because you're activating the long tail, right? You're activating all those donors that aren't at the tippy top of the pyramid and therefore they're not really getting that much attention so this is a first attempt to engage them. So that's why the average donation is going to be lower. But still, the lift in participation is pretty solid, and 47 and 34% participation is also pretty good for a first and fifth year reunion. In the second pilot test, these are selected results, we also saw a pretty solid lift except for the 10 year reunion. And we started to see a little bit of age correlation associated with sign-in rate, right? So basically the sign-in rate started dropping as you got a little bit older. Um, and so these numbers, while they seem kind of promising, they weren't like amazing. They want like, whoa, 200% lift in participation. Like, that's what I was looking for. And so then I dug deeper, and I looked at the, F the class of 2007 fifth year campaign, and really I started looking at all the different donor types. And it turned out that 60% of the donors were in lapsed groups, which was pretty good, and almost half of those donors signed in, which was really nice too. You saw decent signing rates amongst donors, but what happened here? All the people I was going after didn't sign in because they didn't have any reason, they didn't have any reason to sign in. Their face wasn't gonna be visible, so why would they? And this is just yet another ploy the school is using to show up the people who are giving. I'm sorry, I'm channeling my bitter, like long tail donor, potential donor. So how do you engage these individuals? Big question, right? And I was racking my head for a while, thinking, what? We have this really interesting potential here, but what do we do? Because this seems to be where we really can achieve the most and that's where pre-connection comes in. So pre-connection is the idea of giving someone a truly powerful motivator that's divorced from asking for a financial gift. Instead, it's using the concept of time and a timeline. So when I say engaging stakeholders around curiosity, anticipation, and utility, I'm talking about saying, here are all the people who are going to be at the drive conference or are going to be in your graduating class that you haven't even started studying in or are going to be at the reunion event. So there's anticipation 
And now the reason to sign in is selfish. It's not selfless, I'm gonna give it myself, it's selfish, I wanna see who else is gonna be there. Let me give you an example of how powerful pre-connection is. We do maps for both Haas and Chicago Booth right now along the drive, and this is the typical adoption curve of a map that is reconnection oriented. Full-time MBA class of 20, sorry, MBA class of 2012 combined full-time, part-time, evening, weekend, etc. This is what you're looking at. Nice little sloping curve, 32% sign in after a couple weeks. That's solid. That's good. And like the map looks nice. I mean, people filled in industries and, and you know their faces on there. Pretty solid. Let's compare that to pre-connection. We ran an event called the Menlo Circus Networking Event, where we launched a map on 750 people two days before the event started, and we got a 46% sign-in rate. Because they all wanted to see who was going to be there. P.S. Then someone saw it was going to be there and emailed me and said, hey, you want a carpool? And it was an alum I hadn't had a chance to hang out with in a while, and we had an amazing drive down, an amazing drive back, and we connected, and it was a really positive experience. What about the drive map? We're at 54% sign-in right now, and that's just a week old. So I'm comparing four weeks of reconnection with one week of pre-connection, and there's like a you know, more than 20% difference, or 20 percentage point difference. Okay, what about starting a program? You're gonna start an MBA, you're six weeks out, and you wanna meet all your classmates before you get to campus. 90%. Part, uh, sign in rate over a much, you know, the same sort of steep as the curve. So we launched this map on the full-time MBA class of 2015 in July, in mid-July, and they started school in mid-August, and they all wanted to see where everyone was. And when people segmented on city they were in, they then used the cities to have happy hours and things like that to truly pre-connect with people, because it's not just about digital connection, it's about real life connection. It is about bringing people together in a meaningful way. That's what this platform is designed to do, and I hope that's what your donor relations initiatives are designed to do as well. Because that's where the power comes from. Connecting people, giving them awesome experiences. So this kind of shift from fundraising to pre-connection shifted the platform as well. We built activity feeds to show what action was going on inside the map. We created the, we have these admin uh, volunteer tools, which I'll explain in a second to push engagement further and empower certain power users inside the map. We created class notes, a shortcut to class notes that basically says, type an update Facebook style about what's new, and here, checkbox, give the school or the organization permission to republish this or don't. So now your collection process of notes gets massively streamlined into this automated system that sits within a, pro a platform that has engagement instead of something that's a totally separate ask and an email that leads to a weird forum page that you have to reconcile, et cetera. So I see someone not smiling in front going, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> we designed this specifically because um, I had this experience when I was at Harvard and I had submitted a note for my tenure uh, reunion, but then also at Haas as well. Like I spoke with the individual who was responsible for collecting those notes and she said, can you make this easier? I'm like, yeah, we can. There's a resources menu at the top because the community isn't the only thing of value. There's actually a number of free resources that are available to every single stakeholder or alum or member or supporter of an organization that you should make clearly accessible to them, not hidden in these weird web pages or scattered across multiple web pages. So it's a collection of links, that's it. Outbound links, super simple. And there's better search, so you can quickly find people if you know their name and you type it in and it looks up against whatever view you're looking at at the moment. Those volunteer tools are pretty powerful. They enable a subsection of map members, remember you designate as the map manager, to activate the map. So one way you can activate it is encouraging updates. So, okay, is it going to work? Uh-oh, how about now? Was I looking down here and it was working? Great, so what you basically do is you click on this button, it pops up an email, some boilerplate text that says, hey, encourage you to write an update, it signs it as you, it sends the email from you via Bradmap, boom, it sends it out to everyone in the class. We're working on segmentation tools that enable the volunteers to send only to a subsegment within the map, like San Francisco, or technology, or the Axe cohort, or the MBA versus the full-time MBA versus the evening weekend MBA. The second admin tool we've created is called Find Lost Classmates. And the idea here is that you auto-generate 
an email with a list of all of the people whose emails are bounced or missing in our database. And you send it out to everyone else in the map and say, hey, do you know any of these people's updated email addresses? If so, please just drop me a line because the reply to is the volunteer's email address. And I will go ahead and update the map accordingly. And what happens is you crowdsource the process of email recovery and email updating. Then, once let's say we get a couple replies, then you click on the update emails tool, you pick the person or people whose names you've gotten e update emails on, you type in their new email address, and this is the volunteer doing this work, it could also be an admin for the map. You add another, do the same thing, and only the emails that are bounced in our system will show up here. So we filter things down, we made it as drop dead simple as possible. And then you update. And what happens, as soon as you update, we send an invitation to these two people. We also send an email to the admin. And we say, hey, Matt Admin, this volunteer just updated all these email addresses with these external IDs and these first names and last names. We haven't yet hooked up, we haven't done a deep integration into your CRM, but go ahead and do whatever you want to with this data. Because we've deliberately created a lightweight, super light footprint product. We can go deep with integrations over time, but if you want to get things up and running really fast, why not just take this email and plug it into your system as a starting point? That way you get to try things before you spend a year integrating. And finally, we're reintegrating Supporters View into this new format for the map. So Supporters View is simply a tab at the top where you can pivot between classmates and supporters. Supporters is just something you activate once a year, twice a year, and that's when you show this leaderboard. And you can basically build giving directly into the action box. You can connected to any payment processor through the methodology that I described before. And the activity that shows at the bottom is all campaign related rather than being basically updated, update and note related. So this then defined a new model based on pre-connection for how GradMap can really optimize engagement. And it really starts with this pre-connection at the admissions process, believe it or not. That's what the full-time MBA class of 2015 proved. So we launch a student map before the first semester. This is our methodology. And we'll make it visible to everyone by default. The key action is sign in. And then when you're ready to start your first campaign, boom, you put it in campaign mode. People are comfortable with this interface. They know what's going on. Now it's got a gamification element. Then they come in, they give. You try and lift your participation rate as much as possible. And then when the campaign's over, you're back to a directory mode. So it's an evergreen process of having this interface that's exposed to your stakeholders where you can, as Tenny Frost at Haas says, you can turn up the volume on a specific call to action when you want to. And then you can always reactivate as well. What GradMap also, this, this innovation of GradMap 1.0 to 2.0 really made our team realize is that we have a product that's bigger than just alumni and just fundraising. We have a private visual directory platform. And so today I'm actually publicly announcing something that's been sort of inferred in my registration uh, at this event, but I really haven't been talking a lot about it till now which is that GradMap is now a flavor of MapDebate. And MapDebate is the name for the underlying technology that can be used for alumni in the form of GradMap. It can be used for organizations and stakeholders and supporters in the form of OrgMap. It can be used for events in the form of RSV peeps. These are just names of basic configurations that all sit on top of the same platform and all do the same thing that I've described to you already. And all of the features and functions that I walked through previously are in the MapDebate platform. And in the next couple of months, you'll see things like an Eventbrite integration, where you can start a map from Eventbrite in five minutes. Or embeddable maps, so you can create an app and have a public view and embed it into your website. Why not send people where the traffic are, instead of trying to get them to come somewhere else? And you can still maintain the private version of the map for really deep connection, but if you're trying to show off demographics of a donor base or a supporter base within the context of your own digital marketing, mm. embeddable maps mm. are a really cool way to do it. Direct messaging. Email addresses are sacred to us. They're also sacred to you. That's why we focus so much on updating emails and making sure they're as up-to-date as possible and volunteers have tools for updating. But you know, what if lots of people don't sign in with Facebook and LinkedIn? How do you connect with them? We're gonna create a secure direct messaging system that enables people to message one another via basically an alias email address on our system. We're not storing the messages. We're just providing the alias, and then it's up to the two individuals to decide how they're going to connect. And it's also up to the individual to determine whether or not they want to turn that alias on or off instead of what Facebook did, which is basically give us all Facebook email addresses at once without us asking. 
mobile first design. You'll notice, you probably noticed if you tried to sign in from your phone or you tried to sign in from IE9, uh, it didn't really work. That's because this is very much a prototype moving into a full production application. And it's going to be built on Twitter Bootstrap. And finally, roll ups and cross filters. Because a map can only be so large, it can only be so big. If you try and put, we, I was at an earlier presentation where there was a discussion of millions of records and hundreds of thousands of records. Try making a map with 100,000 people. It's, it's dizzying. It's, there's really not a lot you can do with it. It's just tiny little dots and lots of pages. So our strategy is to come up with the right atomic unit. What's the right affinity unit? Is it graduating class and then you provide segmentation by degree type? Is it graduating year and degree type? That's the atomic unit. So you cultivate these nice, intimate little communities. Get everyone to sign in, then you roll them up into a beautiful directory that's wonderfully traversable because everyone's already signed in. And there's some really cool tools that we're going to be coming out with and interfaces for traversing that stuff that's consistent with the kind of user experience we have and enables you to cut across hundreds of thousands or millions of records, but do it in a contextually relevant way. So I'm in technology for my class. There's a bar chart at the top. One year is highlighted, that's the year of my graduation. And then I basically take the, um, a dragger and I pull it across multiple years and all of a sudden the people for finance grows huge because I'm selecting for 10 years of finance or 20 years of finance or only the older graduates in finance because I want to find a mentor and then I filter by mentors. Similarly, we're working on cross filters so you can look up multiple variables. Who's in technology and San Francisco, or technology or San Francisco, and then across multiple years and multiple maps. So that's where we're going and that's just that phase. But more important, I think, are the key takeaways for persuasive visualization in general. Number one, and I hope these came across in, in my talk, keep it simple, super simple. Less is more. Less colors is more, less categories is more, less charts is more unless you're doing these multiples, right? Keep it simple. Think about legibility, so important. Number two, engage the ego if you can. Because hopefully I'm showing you it really works. It really turns out we're all human. Turns out there's some basic psychological tenets that we all predictably kind of fall into. And if you can creatively and in a fun way engage the ego, you're going to see lift in response rates, in engagement, in gifts, in participation, in energy devoted back to your organization. And finally, leverage pre connection. Leverage it. I mean, it, this was a pretty stunning discovery for me. I really didn't put two and two together until we, until we started launching these event maps and started seeing the power of pre-connection. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and let's discuss your questions and comments. Any questions and comments? Wow, I silenced an entire room of people. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I have one, perhaps I have one to an existing uh, directory. Like, have the existing I'm sorry? So right now the question was, does GradMap hold the data in our own environment or can we point GradMap towards an existing directory? Right now we hold the data, but we require a very minimal amount of data for you to provide to us in CSV format. And what we're working with with um, customers like Haas is the ability to do API-based synchronization of the data as well. So that's absolutely a service that we're able to offer our customers, but it's not built into the product for starters, because we want you to try it first and see what the value is and the lift is first. Yes? As time passes and certain constituents don't engage, do you ever use a negative, sort of like we noticed you didn't, or do you just leave it up to their peers to sort of, okay. <laughs> I mean, because you know. There are two, okay, so the question was as time passes and certain people don't engage, do you use negative levers in order to get them to come back. Right. So that actually reminds me of a broader thing I forgot to mention, which is there's, there are a couple ways of opting out of the system. One is to never click on anything in the first place. The other is to click to sign in and to go anonymous, which means you are effectively invisible to everyone in the map, but you can still see everyone in the map. So if you want to be an anonymous donor, or you just want to check out everyone else's profile and not share your own, it's one button click inside your profile. So that's one way we and, and maybe we would send a message like that. Like, hey, we noticed you never clicked on, on these emails. Did you know there was an option to go anonymous so you can still enjoy this benefit? And if they say, we'd probably give them two click button answers and one is, great, show me the map. And the other is, yeah, actually I know that and I still don't want to be a part 
of any of this messaging, and then we know for sure. Yes? I mean, you sound a little bit ageist when I ask this question. I apologize in advance. Uh, the examples you gave us, Booth and Haas, you're working with younger, you know, recent MBA alums. Sure. So there's sort of an inherent youthful bent. Um, it seems that it would, it would lend itself to this kind of a tool. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you've tested this on other pools with maybe older um, constituents, and if there's been responsiveness, and if so, if it's varied from what you saw with the younger people. So um, the first, the second set of pilots tested the 10th and 15th reunion, which is still fairly young, but it's still a little bit further along. Uh, and we have about, I'd say, 15 classes out of the 45 maps that are live. Well, 15, uh, we have about 15 classes out of the total of 45 that are running for us that tend to fall in the slightly older category. We are seeing slightly lower engagement on those. And I mean, I won't shy away from the numbers. You're basically seeing higher engagement with a couple years out and like sort of middle of the road reconnection engagement in the 20% instead of 30%. Maybe it is an ageist thing. But as digital media continues to pervade things over time, you also see basically not just early adopters diving into these networks, but people who are 50, 60 plus creating LinkedIn accounts, et cetera. So I think that there are going to be adopters across a multitude of ages. And maybe that's who we're just going after. I mean, if there's someone who is a 50 or 60 year old, well accomplished tech entrepreneur, and they are willing to be a mentor, and they can indicate it in one checkbox on their profile, and we can make it clear to him or her that's how you do it, there's a lot of value there, because that's another way of giving back. So does that seem like a reasonable response? Yeah. Great. Yes, and back. That, that's where I was going. I, I did the guy with the Dubai vocals and the 30th year uh -huh. uh, planning committee for my high school reunion in June. Do you need a beta uh, for, for that uh, older demographic? And uh, I'll, I'll grab you a bar. <laughs> you know, I would say it just goes back. We were talking about pre-connections, a big lever. How relevant do you think it's going to be to those constituents? And go ahead and, and roll out a directory or an engagement tool accordingly. Uh, we, we, um, it's a public high school. We have, actually have a, a fundraising capital campaign, which is very unusual for a, a public school. And I've been messaging the uh, foundation director about you know, take, take a look at what's going on. Nice. Yes? Yes. We're working on that too. On basic, so the question was, um, your technology gives you the ability, or gives individuals who have given the ability to encourage other people. Is there some sort of kudos or badging or point system that's built in that says, hey, this person's an influencer? We're working on it. It turned out that the level of influencer actions was so low across all the maps, we didn't prioritize developing that feature. Because we felt like other, there was a more fundamental issue at play. Like, wow, giving is a pretty high bar, turns out. Like, that's why we're all here. Giving is a pretty high bar. And so if you're going to try and optimize around encouragement, you need to have a really eager donor base to begin with. And so we wanted to focus on, okay, what gets them signed in and then revisiting? And okay, now can we create influencer points? And now can we gamify? So the second part of that, uh, that influencer, are they able to not part of the, okay, is the influencer available to connect with people not part of the original population? Yeah, they would never, those, anyone who is not a member of the map cannot gain access to it. So by definition, it is a private, closed social network with no organic growth associated with it. It's a unique approach to the concept of social networking because there's no like, hey, join my friend group, et cetera. It's just fixed. Because the people who graduated in that year or in that degree, that list is never going to change. It, it's different than crowdfunding in that way. It's not so much about, hey, I'm gonna post to my Facebook wall that I gave to my school, so you should give too. It's more about activation of an existing community instead. Yes? Can someone build up to multiple communities and then pivot from one to the other? They sure can. So not only can people belong to multiple communities and pivot across them, through that you menu, so we're basically gonna throw in a thing that just says your other maps. But once you sign in, 
wants your basic information, city, industry, etc., ports to your profile in that other community. So if you invite people into a map and you've used an email address that they've already used to register their profile, their stuff will already appear and the segmentation will already appear before you launch. And they'll be comfortable and familiar with it. I think we're out of time. We're one bit, okay, great. So if you didn't have a chance to get your question answered now, please see me afterwards and thank you so much.